Welcome. Today uh, is Wednesday, September 16, 2020. Uh, my name is Gordon McNeely. I'm the chair of the Standing Committee on Health and Social Development. Uh, with us today, we have Trish Altaz, Heath McDonald, Corey Deagle, Sydney McEwen, Hannah Bell uh, joining us. So, um, without further ado, can I get a uh, motion to adopt the agenda? Heath McDonald. And we'll move right into uh, working with our presenter. So it, it's a discussion on the pharmacist ex expanded scope of practice through the uh, pandemic. So um, uh, Prince Edward Island College of Pharmacy Re Registrar Michelle uh, Waynard and Deputy Registrar uh, Jennifer LaPierre will present on this topic. So I'll pass it over to our presenters and uh, the floor is yours for your presentation. Great, thank you. I just want to check my voice level to make sure you can hear me. Um, I'm a little vertically challenged, so it's a little bit hard to see everybody, so I apologize. Um, so again, I'm, my name is Michelle Wyand. I'm the Register with the PEA College of Pharmacy, and uh, to my side here is the Deputy Register, Jennifer LaPierre. So we thank the committee um, for the opportunity to come and speak to you today. Um, there's a couple of items that we would also like to speak around, and that is in particular the role of the PEA College of Pharmacy and our mandate. Uh, the composition of our college council because I think it's important for the committee to understand uh, the decision makers of the college and who they are. And then we'd like to review some of the key initiatives of the PI College of Pharmacy, in particular around expansion of scope of the pharmacist and pharmacy technician. And then again, the college's response to the COVID-19 pandemic. So what activities we undertook as a college to respond during that, um, during that time, or during, still during this time. Um, so jumping right in, the College of Pharmacy was established in 2014 under the Regulated Health Professions Act. Um, we existed as a regulatory body prior to that under the Pharmacy Act, um, but with the Regulated, college, or Regulated Health Professions Act, um, we became a college officially. Um, the primary purpose of the college is to govern the practice of pharmacy with the health and safety of the public um, at the forefront of all of our decisions. And this is certainly reflected in our mission um, of the college, which is governing the practice of pharmacy to advance the health and safety of the public. So ultimately, the college is accountable to the public. And we uh, establish um, a number of objects um, under the Regulated Health Professions Act, um, which include developing and establishing and maintaining and ensuring compliance with um, entry to practice qualifications. So we ensure that our uh, professionals who are entering the practice have the required uh, qualifications to be able to practice in this province. We also uh, develop and, and implement standards of practice and practice directives that help guide and support our pharmacists and pharmacy technicians in their practice. Um, we also look at continuing competence requirements to ensure that our pharmacy professionals are working um, to their full abilities and be able to ensure that they have the required um, competence uh, throughout their careers. So the council of the college is really the committee that makes the decisions of the college. Uh, so they direct the staff to undertake uh, their decisions or carry out their decisions. I think it's important that the committee understand the composition of the college. There are four, um, sorry, 12 um, council members in total, four of which are representatives that are appointed by the Lieutenant Governing Council through the Engage PEI process. And they bring that public perspective to the decisions of the college. And our four, four current public representatives have experience in regulatory affairs, law, health, and education. So it's really important. They have a broad, um, a broad experience and knowledge base that they bring to those decisions when they are looking at um, the self-interest or the public interest. Recently in 2014, with the introduction of the uh, Regulated Health Professions Act, we added a new profession under the college, um, uh, the profession of pharmacy technicians. And so we bring uh, the perspective of the pharmacy technicians through the one appointed individual. Um, and I should mention that our pharmacy technicians and pharmacists are appointed by the minister, but they are elected from the membership, so the registrants of our college. And the remaining seven members are pharmacists who, once again, are elected from the, from the registrant population, and they're appointed by the Minister of Health and Wellness and they bring the perspectives of pharmacy practice to our decisions. Our seven pharmacists and technician have a combined total of 134 years of practice experience from a variety of settings, including community practice or retail setting, as well as uh, a hospital or administrative. 
And in addition to the college uh, council, we have two staff who you are looking at right now. So we're small but mighty. Um, we, uh, myself, uh, I have eight years of pharmacy experience practice before I came into this role, um, uh, both in retail and in hospital experience. And Jennifer to my side. Part time with the college, and I'm also in part time practice uh, still. Um, and I have about 12 years of practice experience. So moving on, I'd like to highlight some of the key <coughs> initiatives of the college. The college undertook the exercise of developing a strategic plan, um, and this would be our first uh, true strategic plan that the college under has, has had in history. Um, so it's a five-year strategic plan from 2019 to 2024. Um, to, to more formalize and our strategic initiatives and directions of the organization. And there were four strategic directions that were identified. Um, the first one is pursuing continuous quality improvement. The second is expanding pharmacy practice. The third is fostering stakeholder relationships. And the fourth is engaging the membership. And so for the purpose of this presentation, I'd like to focus on the expanded scope of pharmacy professionals as that was the interest of the committee um, hearing from us today. So the scope of pharmacists, um, uh, scope of practice for pharmacists and technicians has really evolved um, since 2009. Um, first, the pharmacist scope evolved, and then we introduced the pharmacy technicians in 2014. Um, in 20 2009, pharmacists were able for the first time to undertake a prescribing activity which was called continued care prescription. So they were able to extend the pres prescription uh, for a patient that um, already had a, an active prescription um, on file um, at a pharmacy. And then with the Regulated Health Professions Act, the act further enabled the scope of scope of the pharmacist, and again, we introduced the pharmacy technicians um, as a health professional with a protected title. Uh, pharmacy technicians were, were, were introduced as a profession to further support pharmacist scope of expansion by taking on some of the more technical tasks of, of processing and preparing and packaging a prescription. So freeing up the time of a pharmacist to be able to, to undertake uh, scope exp or further scope expansion. Since 2014, the scope has continued to evolve to where it is today and includes um, drug administration and vaccine prescri prescribing, adaptation and therapeutic substitution, emergency prescribing, continued care prescribing, Pharmacists have the ability to prescribe for 30 different minor ailments, and they also have the ability to undertake or conduct tests. And just by way of, of clarification, um, I think it's important to understand that pharmacists are able to administer drugs and, and prescribe for certain vaccines, um, but we are limited in the list of vaccines that we are able to prescribe for. And these include uh, for conditions such as, or diseases such as diphtheria, hepatitis A, hepatitis B, herpes zoster, HPV, influenza, pertussis, pneumococcal disease, rabies, and tetanus. Pharmacists who also undertake additional training have an expanded authority to also be able to prescribe for travel-related vaccinations. Adaptation and therapeutic substitution. Um, I know my colleague um, Aaron had mentioned and talked about a little bit about that. Um, so I won't go into what adaptation therapeutic substitution means, as I believe the committee has already been briefed on this. The next slide really demonstrates the <coughs> scope of practice for pharmacists across Canada. Um, this is table is brought from um, the Canadian Pharmacists Association, so they undertake work every year to uh, review and update this chart um, to demonstrate the scope of practice of pharmacists across the country. And so you'll see um, PEI, we're kind of in the middle, or a little bit to the left, or sorry, to the right. Um, you'll see all those green checks. Those are the areas of expanded practice that pharmacists and PEI currently have authority um, to undertake. So we're pretty, we're fairly close to some of the other jurisdictions in Nova Scotia, New Brunswick. But what I will highlight is the difference um, is 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 in and around the types and conditions. Um, so the check mark will show that yes, we can prescribe for minor ailments. However, the conditions um, for which we can prescribe can be different from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. And this would be the same for um, uh, diagnostic or 
uh, screening tests that a pharmacist can perform. So although it, it indicates that we do or can order and interpret um, a lab test, um, the number uh, is quite low for what, what we actually have authority. So I want to bring to the attention of the committee the items that we consider um, as a college when we are looking to expand uh, scope um, for a pharmacist or a pharmacy technician. So we look at whether the activity is currently authorized under the Regulated Health Professions Act, whether there are core entry to practice competencies that support that activity, um, the extent to which the competencies are broadly in place uh, within the practice of pharmacy so that they're supported the support that the pharmacy is support is supported um, for all authorized practitioners and the avail avail availability of supplemental training supplemental or training programs so does the college um, is there a is there a training program that's uh, currently available that can be leveraged or do we need to um, implement or uh, develop our own training program and then, of course, it goes without saying, the public interest in the activity that's being added to, um, to a pharmacy practitioner's scope of practice. So by implementing a new scope activity, are there unintended consequences that may occur as a result of implementation? And then are there required safeguards to ensure safe practice of the activity in place, or do we need to develop or look at those types of things? So oftentimes the council of the college will direct the staff to undertake uh, jurisdictional scanning. They will look at other <coughs> policy decisions that may need be needed or that would coincide with any scope expansion or consult experts in the field um, to gain further um, expertise. So for example, when the college um, was considering undertaking the implementation of urinary tract infection prescribing for pharmacists, the college consulted with the Health PEI Antimicrobial Stewardship Subcommittee um, to get their expertise in that, in that particular area um, around microbiology and antimicrobial stewardship before we submitted any proposals to government. And of course, we do consult with the PEI Pharmacists Association when we are contemplating uh, scope, scope changes. So once a council reviews all the relevant information, then a proposal is prepared and submitted to the Department of Health and Wellness for any necessary regulatory changes that might be needed. Um, the Department of Health and Wellness, of course, has their own um, process that they undertake. So that includes research, um, their own jurisdictional scanning, um, and, and a consultative process that they follow before reaching any decision to expand scope. So as you can see, um, decisions around scope of practice do take time. Um, to you know, ensure that we have all the relevant information, um, as well as our um, uh, colleagues in, in the department who uh, review and undertake the same similar activities. Um, so then you throw in a, call, a global pandemic, and of course, the cogs on the wheel suddenly come to a halt. So to review scope expansion, uh, the college has submitted proposals to the Department of Health and Wellness to further expand the scope of the pharmacist. Um, and these include prescribing for additional conditions. Uh, so they're listed below. You'll see um, uncomplicated, acute uncomplicated cystitis, or what's commonly known as urinary tract infections, uh, herpes zoster, impetigo, and conjunctivitis. We also submitted proposals on contraceptive management, um, which includes the prescribing of hormonal uh, contraceptives by pharmacists, as well as comprehensive travel health management which would allow pharmacists to be able to uh, prescribe and administer necessary vaccines and preventative medicines uh, for patients who are traveling abroad. In addition um, to the scope activities that we proposed to the department back, this would have been back in the fall, late fall of 2019. Um, the uh, COVID pandemic certainly highlighted an area that needed to be changed uh, recently to our legislation, and that was to remove the barriers to allow for uh, virtual care. So we did submit additional proposals uh, this spring to, to have those uh, needed regulatory changes um, implemented. So as we understand, the department did uh, complete their consultative process in early March. Um, however, COVID arrived and priorities we believe or understand were changed um, just uh, during the pandemic momentarily. Um, we were advised in August uh, by the department that there is a draft um, 
that uh, will amend the regulations to allow some of these activities. Uh, we have not seen the draft, however, so we can't comment any further on, on which scope activities are going to be um, implemented. And I should add, feel free to add que ask questions at any point. Do, do you, does anybody want to ask any questions right now about that? Okay. So the college certainly did undertake work during the pandemic. Um, we had certainly had a response um, during the pandemic. Uh, early on when we recognized that uh, the pandemic was here, uh, we redeployed staff home and we transitioned to a virtual office so that our staff could continue to conduct um, uh, the necessary work um, of the college, especially in and around registration services. So ensuring that um, registrants were uh, able to access um, registration information and continue the registration process, um, as well as uh, looking at supports for our registrants, so both pharmacists and pharmacy technicians. And I should also note pharmacies, um, as we do license uh, and provide permits to pharmacies. There certainly was continued collaboration with our national stakeholders, which included NAPR, which is the National Association of Pharmacy Regulatory Authorities, uh, as well as with Health Canada on COVID-related issues. <clears throat> Excuse me. And we also collaborate with, the, collaborate with the Department of Health and Wellness and the PEI Pharmacists Association to address issues. Um, and I'm sure many of you are, are familiar with the 30-day supply limitations that occurred during COVID. Uh, we certainly saw increased demands on the Canadian drug supply, um, as well as a global drug supply from both patients who were seeking additional refills um, of their medications, and also from the anticipated impacts from shutdowns of generic drug uh, manufacturers uh, located across the globe. The college worked with our, our colleagues in the uh, Department of Health and Wellness and also with the Pharmacy Association to implement um, a limit um, on dispensing, so limiting the supply to 30 days to ensure that there was an adequate supply for all patients and not just a few. And we were felt that it was very important for us to collaborate with those, depart with those uh, organizations and departments because those decisions certainly had impacts on pharmacies and pharmacists and pharmacy technicians working in those pharmacies on increased workloads as well as on potential financial impacts um, of, of, of the broader public. We also looked at amendments to regulations to support care during the pandemic. Uh, the federal government had implemented an exemption which allowed pharmacists to undertake certain prescribing activities around narcotic controlled and targeted substances. Um, there were prohibitions that uh, existed in our pharmacists and pharmacy technician regulations around uh, pharmacists being able to uh, extend a prescription for a controlled substance. So when, the, uh, when Health Canada uh, released their exemption, we had to undertake uh, regulatory changes to lift that prohibition. So we certainly worked with the department to, to undertake and, and amend the pharmacists and pharmacy technician regulations so that we could further support our pharmacists and patients during that time. We had regular communications with registrants on COVID-related issues. Uh, we undertook work to create a specific web page for our registrants and members of the public um, on COVID-related topics. And amendments were also made to the Pharmacy Act uh, regulations to remove barriers to practice. And this include removing the requirement for prescriptions for methadone, for example, um, that are used for the treatment of opioid use disorders. Uh, there's a, there was a requirement in our regulations that, that pres those prescriptions be faxed from the, from the prescriber. Um, so this might seem like a small issue. Uh, physicians at this time were, re were working from home with limited access sometimes to fax machines um, and they were not able to, uh, to pick up the phone and call a pharmacy to, pr to provide that prescription by phone. Um, so we worked with the department once again to make sure that those barriers were, were removed in our, in our regulations. Um, one thing I should point out is that uh, should our public health emergency uh, declared by the Chief Public Health Office and our officials, um, if that is lifted, pharmacists will no longer be able to have that ability to continue a prescription for a controlled substance, even though the Health Canada has uh, provided an exemption um, for prescribing uh, for, for these particular uh, medications. 
and Health Canada actually has ex extended that exemption for pharmacists until next year. So as we understand, Health Canada certainly is interested in uh, reviewing the successes or um, the successes of this exemption over the next uh, of, the, of the coming months to review and determine whether or not that exemption will become uh, a regulatory, a permanent regulatory change for pharmacists to be able to uh, continue prescriptions, for example. So that's the end of our presentation, so I'm happy to field uh, any questions. Uh, Jennifer and I can certainly tag team. Um, yeah. I'll open it to the floor. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, definitely. Great, great presentation. Uh, Sydney? Thank you, and thank you both for coming in. Um, can you speak to uh, more about who you're dealing with with the negotiation, you know, the most recent negotiation for uh, prescribing that had, I guess, you know, started? The first meetings, I think, were in January, is that right, of this year? And uh, you say you're waiting now. Who are you actually meeting with in those conversations? And then, and then what, where is that uh, currently? Right. Uh, so we have been meeting um, with both the Deputy Minister, um, with also uh, the uh, Director of um, Health and Wellness, as well as the legislative uh, lawyer uh, who works with the department and drafts the legislation. Um, and, and the PEF Pharmacists Association also was in attendance in some of those meetings. Um, the most recent um, information that we received w was not through meeting, but by phone, by phone call. Um, so we haven't met recently, um, but just had communication by, by phone. Sydney? So sorry. Uh that is uh, uh, Mark Spidell, the yes. deputy minister. And sorry, you said the director of health? Um, yes, Kevin Barnes, okay. uh, director of, um, and I can't remember his position, I apologize, um, his title. And then, of course, the pharmacy. And you said you had a, 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 there was a phone call recently? Yes, we received a phone call. So the, the, the recent information that we received was back in August mm -hmm. to indicate that there was a draft, um, preliminary draft for regulatory changes uh, that would incorporate uh, some of the items that we had um, submitted in our proposal. Uh, but we have not yet seen that draft. We're still waiting for the draft. Uh, Sydney? Thank you, Chair. So you say some, did they spe specify which they were interested in and which they weren't, or? We're looking at uh, the addition of urinary tract infections, mm -hmm. as well as the, um, not necessarily scope expansion, but the barrier to virtual care. So removing, there's a requirement in our regulations for in-person, uh, uh, for that the patient has to be in person um, in, front of, in front of that pharmacist in order to be able to prescribe in that barrier. Um, that's causing a barrier, especially during a pandemic. So that um, was also um, uh, it highlighted as one of the changes. Now, whether there's additional changes, I'm not aware. Sydney? Thank you, Chair. Would you mind flipping back to that uh, slide where you had the, the proposed, you know, the, the UTIs and then the... Con there it is. There it is. So, one, two, three. So, Oops. they've they've, yes. I, they've expressed that they're looking at two of those four. That's correct. And, and, sorry, Chair. Thank you, Chair. And not even really two, because uh, when you talk about prescribing for additional conditions, they're only looking at one more condition? Yes. Did they uh, uh, give any reasons as to why they're, they're holding back on your other requests? Um, they didn't give specific reasons. Um, I can only assume that it had to do with the consultation. Um, so part of the work that the department does when implementing any sort of regulatory change, especially around prescribing, is that they consult with other prescribers. Um, so I can only assume that uh, the information that they received during the consultation, um, you know, contributed to their decision. Sydney? Uh, that's good for now. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Hannah? Thank you, Chair. Kind of following on from Sydney's comments there, um, you know, one that we've heard um, a lot about is contraceptive management, um, particularly even I think even more so under COVID, because um, right now contra for, to, for contraceptive management or, or referral, um, you have to be able to see a doctor for it in person, which frankly, people either don't have a doctor or they're not not being able to get into that that um, appointment because people aren't booking them. 
Um, and so we have no other routes for people to be able to get a prescription or, or a change or an extension. We don't have Planned Parenthood here. We don't have those other mechanisms. Um, and so I'm really <coughs> concerned about the, the impact for um, that aspect of women's health. Um, and you know, you mentioned consultation, but consultation isn't just in that case about prescribers, it's also about the social impact. Is that part of, uh, how, what, how, I guess I, I'm, I'm hearing you're not the ones that, that, that are doing the consultation, it's the health department. Um, has, has that ever come up though in conversation or, or, or around the need for that to be looked at for more than just a prescription process? And I wish I could speak to that, but unfortunately, um, okay. you're right. I'm not the, um, you know, the person to uh, uh, to speak to how the department um, undertakes their consultative process. Hannah, thank you. No, and, and I, you know, I don't mean to put you on spot, but it's just, yeah, you know, partly it's to say it out loud that we need to kind of recognize that, but but also it means then that I can go and ask somebody else. <laughs> this is this has become this is a, a barrier for access. Um, that creates um, an imbalance in, in terms of you know potential access to care and, and exacerbated you know extremely more so because of the current situation that we're in um, and that's also the case for you know like even something like you mentioned like UTIs which is I know in other jurisdictions has been one of the kind of low-hanging fruit in terms of, of patient care for, for pharmacists to be able to do um, Travel maybe not quite so much right now. <laughs> right. Yeah. Are there? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, are there other other things that have come up in the meantime where you would be looking at preparing a new proposal? Um, right now, we're looking just to um, confirm and, and really um, implement the proposals, uh, the, the, the areas of expansion that we've proposed thus far. Um, we've developed, um, as part of the work of, of our proposal, we've developed um, practice directives. Um, and as I mentioned, we did consultation, especially around the urinary tract infections with the antimicrobial stewardship subcommittee. Um, so they weighed in on the practice directive that we would, uh, you know, we, that we would put out for pharmacists to help support that practice. Um, so, you know, we certainly, uh, we certainly saw value um, in allowing and, and giving that authority to pharmacists to be able to prescribe for urinary tract infections. Um, and, and, you know, each one of these activities that we look at, you know, the council certainly, as an, and as you saw, has, you know, a variety of considerations when we look at a new scope um, activity. Um, and so, you know, these are the ones that we landed on that we felt that a pharmacist could um, provide a contribution to care. Anna? On that. Thank yeah. you, Chair. Yeah, and, and I'm, I'm referring back to what you said were your considerations for scope expansion and, and uh, you know, recognize that impact that, that you, when you were putting a proposal in place, you, you've, you've already taken it through that lens. So when you're making that recommendation to Health PEI, or to the department, sorry, you're making that on the basis that there is public interest and demand, there is um, the, the training programs are in place and, the, and the, the competencies are in place. So it's not a question of, oh, we can't do that. It's, it's more a question of, of the regulatory piece. Um, in particular with contraceptive management, um, there's no diagnosis that's required. No. Um, so this is purely about, um, you know, drug knowledge and, and being able to, um, you know, to, um, you know, select the appropriate medication for that particular patient right. with respect to hormonal contraception yeah. in particular. Okay, I'll leave yeah. it for there for now. Okay. Thank you very much for that. Trish? Thank you, Chair, and thank you for the, uh, this presentation. Um, I want to go back to something you mentioned uh, that is currently being considered around uh, the uh, um, uh, legislation that prevents uh, pharmacists from engaging in virtual care activities, uh, and that that's something that's being considered. Um, I'm wondering about uh, uh, possible overlap with the, uh, the Maple Virtual Care uh, Primary Care app that um, uh, is now uh, being offered or has been offered um, to those waiting uh, for a family doctor. Um, do you have any, um, um, uh, can you share any, any uh, thoughts on uh, possible overlap in terms of potential scope of practice for a pharmacist that sh might be there? Um, I think there's actually significant overlap mm -hmm. um, with what uh, Maple Virtual Care can provide. Um, and, and what the pharmacist even currently can can prescribe for. Um, when you look at the um, list of conditions um, on the Maple Virtual Care website, um, you know, with the exception of a few, and these are some that we're looking to expand further into, um, I think there's significant overlap um, with the two. 
Yeah. Trish? Uh, thank you, Chair. So um, uh, is that a discussion that was ever, um, uh, you know, that has happened at all yet with the, with the department about, you know, the potential for pharmacists to take on some of that role if that barrier were removed from the legislation? So, um, you know, the, the announcement around Maple Virtual Care, I think um, we found out just as the public found out. So um, we were not aware that, um, I guess, Maple Virtual Care was going to be utilized for the general population, the general public. We certainly were aware um, that Maple was being utilized, um, especially in the more rural settings, um, t in long-term care facilities. Um, to to be able to provide care to patients where there were shortages um, in, in primary health care providers in that particular area. Um, so the the announcement or the I guess the news that um, you know they were going to be offering some of the same services to the general public um, through our department uh, was was relative news to us as well. Thank you, Chair. And have you been uh, provided with any sort of expected timelines for um, that legislation uh, to be changed? So, are they looking? Or do you know if that would be brought forward um, in the the next sitting, or is that have you not been given any? So, idea? right now, it's a regulatory change, so we don't oh. need a sitting of the House in Sorry. order to make those changes. Um, so, it's it's just has to go um, up the floors and down um, okay. to be approved. So, Sorry, what's that? Okay, thank you for clarifying that. I'm sorry, I misunderstood. I thought that was a, a legislative barrier. Okay, so just regulation. Yeah, it, is, it is a regulatory change that is necessary. All right. Trish? But, sorry, sorry. I'm no. just going to respond that we haven't, we haven't received a time um, or a date, uh, but knowing that there is a draft would suggest <coughs> that, um, you know, it, it could be imminent, but we haven't been provided with a date. Uh, thank you, Chair. So uh, again, uh, um, about uh, you know possible regulatory changes that might uh, increase scope of practice for pharmacists. I'm wondering about um, testing for COVID-19 and if that might be um, something that pharmacists, as we continue to expand testing, um, that might be within the scope of practice of pharmacists and something that um, uh, might be possible down the road. So it wouldn't be currently possible. There would be a necessary regulatory amendment in order to add um, the test. So when I was talking, when I mentioned about the different scopes of practice across the country, and although it looks, it might look on a chart that we are very similar, we certainly do have differences in, um, you know, the the level of authority. So we we all might be able to, um, in legislation, be able to order or conduct or perform a test, um, but we in Prince Edward Island are limited to the number of tests by name. Um, so there's three there's three tests, um, and I. And our, an HbA1c and a blood glucose that a pharmacist can perform um, or conduct that test. Um, so we would have to have a regulatory change, as, as we understand, in order to be able to, for pharmacists to be able to provide COVID testing. It's certainly something that's happening in, in in jurisdictions in the West. So in Alberta, for example, um, it would also depend on the, um, the the I guess the plan for our chief public health office um, to do more widespread uh, non-symptomatic um, testing. Mm -hmm and whether we could play a role in that. Okay, just one more yeah, question. Determined. Thank you. Um, all right, uh, yes, thank you for that. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering, uh, you know, we're, uh, we're talking about different ways of expanding uh, scope of practice, but I think, you know, one of the issues also is around uh, compensation and whether or not pharmacists can um, bill for different, um, uh, you know, activities, uh, renewing prescriptions and, uh, and other, um, other, other uh, responsibilities that they may be taking on as uh, practice uh, expands scope of practice. So I wondered if you could touch on that a little bit, if that's something that the college, um, it, is the college engaged in those discussion? Is that not part of your role at all? It is, an, it is okay. not part of our mandate. Um, in fact, we have a prohibition on our legislation that prevents colleges from um, negotiating or acting on behalf of any party for negotiation of fees. So, um, so that, no, we are not part of that. Um, so that would be the role of the, of the PEI Pharmacists Association. Um, or, and while we may have very similar um, um, interests, so you know we both have interests in uh, scope expansion for our pharmacy professionals, um, but our mandates are very different. So the college is a mandatory um, licensing. You, you have to be a, a, a registrant of our college in order to practice pharmacy in this province, whereas the Pharmacists Association um, certainly advocates on behalf of the pharmacists and pharmacy technicians and pharmacy owners in, in PEI. Okay, that's, that's all for you. Sydney? Thank you, Chair. Um, you know, we're the, the smallest province in the country with, you know, obviously healthcare access issues. And it always bothers me when we aim for average in any number of things. And I wonder, you know, a uh, question you and, and kind of a big picture thing, but like what would it mean for PEI 
if we had the greatest scope of practice for pharmacists in the country? Um, it's a really good question. Currently, the broadest scope of practice for pharmacy is, is in Alberta, um, and they've held that, um, that level of authority um, you know, since late, uh, to, I think it was 2008, um, I believe. Um, to date, no other province has, has expanded to that authority. Um, it's a good question as to why. Um, you know, why are we not looking at that or, and all other jurisdictions? Um, I think, you know, from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, we have unique needs. Um, and so, you know, scope expansion for a pharmacist in one area, um, you know, may be more valuable than, than another. Um, and, and I think we have to look at, you know, each, each unique societal need um, and our public needs in those particular jurisdictions. Um, but yes, good question. Why we haven't, you know, caught up to Alberta in our, in our scope of practice is a, it's a good question. City? Thank you, Chair. And, and uh, you raise a really good point, unique needs, right? Like it's easy for, you know, for a politician to say, here, let's expand the scope of practice wide open, but it's, it, it has to be smart, it has to be targeted too, you know? I, I'm sure if, if we were having this conversation, like I, I noticed uh, up north, they have very limited what they can do, but I'm sure the need there is probably much different because of, of simple physician access, you know, back and forth spots too. Um, the 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 tr uh, talk about like the, the training or education that pharmacists are graduating with now, and and also your own professional development as well. Where is that at in comparison to to the the scope of practice that that we're providing? So there's a, certainly an entry to practice competency that is expected to be met, um, and there are standards for accreditation for each pharmacy college across the country um, with respect to um, educational outcomes. Um, so there's certainly a baseline level. Um, we're seeing, of course, now in the most recent years that um, things like um, uh, injection training is, is, is being incorporated as part of that curriculum, um, which is why um, in this province, we made the decision to do what we call an extended practice certification. So um, you don't just register as a pharmacist and, and you're automatically given the authority to um, provide injections. Um, because not all of our uh, registrants at the time of implementation for drug administration um, were at the same level. So we had new graduates who um, had undertaken that training as part of their program, but we had some of our more seasoned um, uh, registrants who would never have had that training as part of their curriculum. So we, we certainly look at that when we make our decisions around scope expansion. So is it something that's part of our part of the curriculum, um, or do we need? Um, and when we do need additional training, and that's where we set it aside and we call it an extended practice. Sydney, thank you, uh, Chair. And, and I hope that you know, these changes are going to happen under this term of, of government for sure, and, and, and more and, and more progressive changes. I mean, I think back to when. Uh, the province was really pushing uh, the changes in our model of care, right? When we when we were giving expanded scope of practice to a number of different health professionals in the province, right? And and uh, you know to our licensed practical nurses and, and and that type of thing. And I I want and I believe it will happen that that push uh, will happen in in your line of work as well. That we can keep pushing for that. So I'm good. Thank you, Chair. Heath. Hey, just. Uh um, I'm listening to your presentation and seeing the difference between the uh, Pharmacist Association and the and your college. Uh, what, in your opinion, uh, are the immediate concerns for your organization? Um, so just to clarify, are you re referring to during COVID or just in general? I think my second question was going to be, what are the gaps that COVID exposed? But my first question is in general. Um, so, you know, I, I think we're, we are a small college, um, so we certainly do have challenges um, in being able to carry out, um, you know, the activities of some of our larger um, organizations. Um, and, and, you know, yet we're still tasked with, um, we're still tasked with the same, um, I know, requirements in legislation as our counterparts. Um, but, you know, we have a really good uh, working uh, council who certainly supports uh, the college in, in those activities. Um, during COVID, um, you know, COVID certainly, um, like, again, there's two, there's two sides to this, I think. There's what the college ourselves and our response and what we were able to do during COVID. And then there's, uh, the, you know, what COVID exposed for um, our, our practitioners. Um, so from the college perspective, um, you know, we, we had to jump very quickly and, and learn some virtual uh, means, uh, just like everyone else. 
um, to be able to carry out our work. Um, but you know, there are advantages to being small as well because um, you know, with two people, you can figure that out pretty quickly how you how you do that. Um, but as I you know highlighted in in my presentation, that um, you know, COVID certainly exposed areas of our legislation that um, you know were problematic during the pandemic, such as in person, um, that requirement for in person. Um, as well as uh, the issues that we had surrounding um, our ability to be able to um, do prescribing activities with controlled substances. So we certainly, we had to take, undertake that work at that time. Um, you know, looking forward into the future, you know, we have to sit down and make a decision on what you know, what areas we should keep. Um, so things that, um, as I mentioned, um, with respect to controlled substances, the amendments that were made to our legislation um, are only during a uh, state of emergency or a public health emergency. Um, so those only apply um, if we have those two situations. So is it appropriate for a pharmacist to be able to extend um, a controlled substance outside of those situations? So those are some of the things that we're looking at um, and we'll be working with Health Canada as well to see if this is, if, if you know, the ability of a pharmacist to be able to undertake prescribing activities with controlled substances is something that instead of being an exemption from the regulations will actually just become part of the regulations federally. So, so what you're about to receive at some point that you haven't seen yet, the that's not included in that. So, in person, uh, we understand is has been incorporated into that draft. So, removing the um, the requirement for the patient to be in front of the pharmacist during a prescribing activity, um, we understand is part of that uh, change that's coming forward. But as far as say opioids or something like that, that is that part of that as well? Or That's not? part of that. Um, we've not had those discussions with the department. Um, we're kind of waiting to see what the decision is from our federal government as well around opioids um, and the ability and the ability of pharmacists to be able to undertake those prescribing activities and then uh, make some decisions. If it's going to exist as an exemption, um, that exemption will eventually expire. Um, so then it's a moot point. So we're waiting to hear what our federal government will also be 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 doing in, with respect to that. Perfect. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I just had a couple, a few questions. Um, so you, you mentioned uh, your strategic plan from 19 to 24. Um, that was obviously done pre-COVID, mm -hmm. and that's a five-year plan. So looking back, after you did your strategic plan, then COVID hits. How would that have changed now? Um, that five-year plan knowing what we know now? Um, I think the, the key initiatives are really still the same, yeah. but it's the activities under those initiatives that um, we may see adjustments. Um, and of course, we undertake that exercise every year. Um, we look at our, our uh, operational plan and in relation to our strategic directives, um, and then sometimes we change, we pivot, and we make, and we make different decisions. Um, so that work will be done um, in the coming months um, for the new uh, fiscal year. Um, and so we may certainly be looking at uh, different activities um, to achieve our uh, strategic objectives under that strategic plan. Um, some of the other healthcare professions we talk about recruitment quite a bit and um, just wanted to get a sense of what is the recruitment like for your organization for pharmacists into PEI? Is it difficult? Are we going to face a shortage in the future or are we in good shape moving forward? So the college per se does not um, engage in recruitment activities. Um, what I can say is we've certainly seen growth um, over the past five years um, in our number of pharmacists and technicians. Of course, technicians uh, 2013 would show zero, whereas in 2014 was the first um, time we introduced that profession. So we're seeing um, an increase. Um, as well, there were uh, imposed deadlines um, for upgrading skills by those pharmacy technicians. So we certainly have seen an upswing in those professions. Um, but a pharmacist in general, um, you know, we, we continue to grow. Our registrant list um, grows each year, um, you know, not by leaps and bounds, but, uh, you know, there's only so much, um, so many uh, pharmacies and, and, and pharmacy positions uh, f uh, or in the healthcare system yeah. as well, as we also have our hospital pharmacists. Um, so there's only a certain number. Um, we will never, you know, be the, be the same, um, we'll never reach the same numbers that um, our colleagues in Nova Scotia, as no. for example, would, would, would reach. When we had Erin McKenzie in last week, we talked about, she, she mentioned that Nova Scotia was able to move quickly during COVID on a few different things. And I think there was four or five different issues that Nova Scotia moved quickly on and PEI didn't move at all. So um, can you comment on that? And uh, do, do you think that was... 
do you think we need to be able to move and adjust if we have a second wave? So uh, with respect to Nova Scotia, I believe that the expanded scope activities were um, already well along on their way to being implemented. Um, I think there was already decisions by government. Um, what I think in Nova Scotia the difference is that um, you know their government made a decision to, to remunerate. So, um, and that certainly changes um, the game for, I think, pharmacists. Um, I won't get into all that conversation on remuneration, but um, it certainly, um, I think, added to the ability to, to respond quickly in Nova Scotia. But the regulatory um, changes yeah. or those decisions, I guess, by the College of Pharmacists had already been made. Um, and they have a slightly different framework than we do in, in PEI. So the Nova Scotia College of Pharmacy uh, Pharmacists are able to make those decisions around scope expansion in certain areas. Um, uh, so that, you know, the, the legislation gives the authority to be able to, um, you know, give a, an injection, for example, um, Nova Scotia College of Pharmacists is able to decide what injections, and we don't have that authority here, the way our legislation is written. Would you like to see that change? <laughs> we always like to see change. Um, <laughs> that uh, certainly helps us be able to respond, and, and, and especially, you know, during a pandemic. Yeah. Um, the flu season is upon us, and, and when, when Aaron McKenzie was here, mixed with COVID, there were some real issues and some, some you know, some difficult conversations that we had last week that, that were, were um, kind of concerning, and it, it's that more people will be looking for the flu shot, um, that the amount of people that pharmacists can, can service are gonna, gonna drop to, to almost 25% in a few different cases. Um, can you talk about that a little bit. Are we ready? Has have we done enough? And and can this, you know, can we can we push push to have a a, a safer flu season for Islanders? So the college, um, you know, supports our pharmacists in the form of a practice directive. Um, so the college really sets the standard, so the minimum standard of what's required, and gives direction on how to carry it out. But we don't get into kind of that. Um, you know, um, detail around how to achieve the standard. Um, and, and that's for good reason. We, 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 we leave it to the pharmacy or pharmacist or health professional to make those decisions and what works best in, in their particular environment. Um, so what, what, what might work in a small rural pharmacy may look very different than what would work in a, in a larger, um, busier pharmacy in, in Charlottetown. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, the, the, the college does not um, get into the minutia of how to carry out those, those standards. Yeah. Um, do I think we're ready? I think there certainly are challenges, and, and um, Aaron certainly identified some of the challenges um, that, that uh, we have, especially in the event of a second wave. Um, or twindemic, as I think they're calling it now. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, there's team-based care. Um, you know, pharmacists have, have changed the way they deliver um, care in, in team-based so that there's no cross, um, uh, I guess, contamination if a, if, a, if a team member becomes ill with COVID. Um, so this challenge is certainly there. Um, and, and, you know, just their personal protective equipment. Yeah. Um, Aaron highlighted some of those issues. Um, around, you know, personal protective e equipment, it will be necessary. Um, but you know, we certainly, ex we certainly, um, from the college's perspective, expected that pharmacists had some of those things in place already. Um, so disinfecting um, in between patients, ensuring the area is clean um, and ready for um, for safe care. So those are certainly some of the baseline things we would have expected anyway. Great, Hannah. Thank you, Chair. Um, while we were in the meeting, this uh, committee meeting, um, there's been an announcement from the BC Healthcare um, through a public health order. Dr. Bonnie Henry has expanded nurses, registered nurses' prescribing powers to include um, safe supply eligibility through Pharmacare um, to provide safer alternatives to street drugs. And I think that's, in a, that's obviously in a direct response to the opioid crisis, which is happening, you know, in an extreme case in, in BC. But it does sort of bring questions around, you know, with limitation of lists and things that you'd spoken about before. Being able to be flexible outside of a public health crisis is something I think we heard a bit about last, last week as well, as the Chair mentioned. Um, so while we may not have the same extent that they have in BC, I think it's, it's that kind of timeliness of response and the willingness to use existing resources. It's an extreme example of that. 
what I'm thinking of is something that the chair's referenced, which is, you know, when and if a vaccine becomes available, if we have to go through this cumbersome regulatory process to get something added to the list, it doesn't seem to be the most effective, effective way. Um, you know, as my colleague Sid has said, one of the shortcuts in that is how can we do this to be better than average? And, and um, the list seems to me to be very restrictive. In other jurisdictions, how is that tackled? Do other jurisdictions have a limited list like we do here in terms of what is and is not allowed, or, is, or are we unique in that space? So, so it, it varies. Um, yeah. Some colleges have, um, some jurisdictions have the ability to amend those lists um, at a college level, and others, um, it's 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 right in their regulation. So, um, it, there's a varied um, bil ability to, I guess, make those changes um, quickly. Mm -hmm. Anna? Yeah. On our list right now, as I understand, it's 30, 30, 30, 30, 30 Yes. 30. yes. Correct. Minor, minor conditions. conditions. That's correct. Minor conditions. Okay. I guess you can help me understand. I, I'm, I'm really failing to understand why we need to limit what can be prescribed. I understand, you know, the restrictions around um, class class one drugs, and and you know, obviously this thing that's happening in BC is an extreme case under public health order, which could be rescinded. Um, what would what are the reasons for needing to have a limitation? Would you be able? Is there something you could speak to? I think that you know there are certain um, you know scope activity or certain conditions um, where it would require a diagnosis that would be outside of the scope of, of a pharmacist to be able to, to perform. So if it requires um, you know an extensive diagnosis, um, that's really just not in the scope of practice for pharmacists. Um, so when we look at expanded scope activities, like I mentioned, we certainly consider what a baseline education um, you know what what education uh, a pharmacist has at the point of, of entry to practice. Um, we look at whether or not, um, you know, it's part of their core competency. We look at whether or not there are, uh, is additional training that they could take um, to increase their skills in a particular area. And so a perfect example of that was injections. Um, pharmacists prior to 2014 did not provide injections, it was not part of their um, core competencies, and uh, they, they undertook additional training. Um, and, and that work was done at a national level to ensure that there was consistency in that training. Um, and there was a, an additional competency that was added uh, to, to address the needs of a pharmacist when providing an injection. So, you know, there were certainly, um, you know, being able to prescribe for anything and everything. Um, if it requires a diagnosis, then, you know, I would, I would say that pharmacists don't necessarily always have the, the, the skills to be able to do that. Um, but there are certainly situations where if there is a diagnosis or a diagnosis is not necessary, that a pharmacist certainly has the competencies to be able to prescribe for a particular a particular condition. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I guess my my follow up to that is it's 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 about looking at it from a different angle. I mean, obviously, right now what we have is is here's a very narrow bucket of what you are allowed to do as determined by the Department of Health. But we've heard really clearly that part of the role of the college is about establishing those credentials and competencies people are not working in this industry or through the regulated health professional space if they don't have a very clear picture of what their competencies are. So, I, you know, I fail to see sort of how somebody, frankly, from the Department of Health is going to be better placed to advise qualified pharmacists what is in their scope of practice and their competency. Um, another way to look at that is perhaps that the list would be easier to say what you can't do rather than what you can. And that may be an, another more effective way, perhaps, to, uh, in, in, for example, class one drugs, you know, or, or other, or as like you said, something complex with a diagnosis. Um, it may be easier to define that list. We certainly recognize there are limitations in our legislation um, and the ability of what the college can and cannot do with respect to scope expansion. Um, and, and yes, I guess. In an ideal world, sure, the college would have that ability to be able to make those decisions, um, but unfortunately, we currently don't. Our legislative framework doesn't support it. Okay. No, thank you for that. I appreciate it. Thank you, Chair. Right. Any other questions, committee members? Perfect. Um, so, thank you very much for coming. Is there anything that you'd want to, in closing, do you want to leave us with anything or? 
Um, one, thank you for the invitation. Um, you know, we were we were happy to be able to come in and even just share who we are, because um, I think there's sometimes that um, um, you know we are confused, I guess, with other organizations. So it's 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 a great opportunity for us to be able to share who we are and what our mandate is and and how we make our decisions. So I appreciate the opportunity to be able to do that, um, and just I think it's been highlighted that. Um, you know, there's still lots of work for us to do, um, especially COVID-related um, issues. Uh, so the college certainly has some work ahead of us to be able to, um, you know, respond and be able to be prepared for, um, you know, the event that we have um, increased cases and, and life changes um, as we currently know it. So as a result of the pandemic. So thank you. Perfect. Thank you very much. You did a wonderful job. Um, so we'll take uh, about a uh, one minute break. We'll allow you to just exit and then we'll continue on with the meeting. Does that sound good? Um, so number four, discussion of uh, schedule and just a few things. We've been trying to line up multiple presenters for the next few meetings. Next week, September 23rd, we'll have Mike Redman in from the Community Outreach Center being added to the agenda with Sonia Cobb and uh, Deputy Minister Keedwell to present on affordable housing development program. So that's uh, next week. There's two different, two different people in that day. September 30th. 30th, we'll have Dr. Heather Kaiser present after the Canadian Health, uh, the Mental Health Association. Both presentations are on mental health and addiction. So that's us kind of clumping in different, different uh, themes. And uh, the last note is uh, the request to bring in Dr. Martha Carmichael. Uh, Den uh, Denise Lewis Fleming, the CEO of Health PEI, asked if the letter could also be directed to Mary Sullivan, who is the director of home care palliative care and geriatric care. Just wanted to make sure that this was okay with the committee. Perfect. Yeah, perfect. So that's a uh, discussion of scheduling and then um, uh, new business, any new business at this time? Uh, Heath? Yeah, I was wondering if it, it'd be worth our while that uh, I was reading where the feds are looking at making some changes to nursing homes. Uh, private, public, what have you, and the regulations surrounding them. 
I'm wondering if we should bring in, um, I think there's a private nursing home organization, board of directors, I'm not sure who it is, or, but it might be worthwhile because, I mean, I know from COVID, the gaps that we've seen with obviously the deaths in Nova Scotia and so on and so forth, I'm wondering what maybe some of the changes that are going to be made here or that they're actually looking to make or maybe even government's making some changes, I don't know, mm -hmm. but it might be worthwhile to have a discussion around nursing homes. Yeah, absolutely. And I guess our, our whole theme around was about things that, that affected COVID, so that might, uh, that might um, fit in nicely, but it's open to the committee for discussion on that. Would you like to try to find a way to... Yeah. Uh, Trish? Yeah, um, Heath, that's exactly what I'm trying to figure out as well, to be honest. I'm not sure either. So um, I think it's, you know, valuable to bring uh, private nursing homes uh, into the conversation to be able to ask questions. So, but it's, I don't know who we ask. Um, so, Corey? Be able to look into who. Yeah, and that's what we'll do. We'll, we'll ask the court clerk to look into it over the next couple of days and, and uh, maybe get back to us through correspondence. Perfect. Uh, anything else at this time? Perfect. Can I get a motion to adjourn? <laughs> Corey Deagle. Meeting is adjourned. <laughs>